Catastrophes like this can result from the unexpected release of toxic, reactive, or flammable fluids in processes involving hazardous chemicals. Hundreds of people have died, thousands injured, and millions of dollars in damages inflicted by the accidental release of such chemicals. Hazardous chemical releases therefore pose a significant threat to employees and the citizens of surrounding communities, as well as to facilities, equipment, and the environment. The U.S. government has enacted a standard called Process Safety Management of Highly Hazardous Chemicals to help assure safe and healthy workplaces. This program provides an overview of the requirements for meeting that standard. Process Safety Management, or PSM, is defined as the proactive identification, evaluation, and mitigation or prevention of chemical releases that could occur as a result of failures in processes, procedures, or equipment. Some states have their own PSM standard, which meets or exceeds federal requirements. A list of states with PSM plans can be found on the OSHA website. Let's get started by discussing who must comply. Process safety management applies to those companies dealing with any one of more than 130 specific toxic and reactive chemicals in listed quantities. The OSHA website provides a list of those chemicals. The standard also includes flammable fluids in quantities of 10,000 pounds or greater. The key provision of PSM is Process Hazard Analysis, or PHA. The PHA is a careful review of what could go wrong and what safeguards must be implemented to prevent releases of hazardous chemicals. Employers must identify those processes posing the greatest risks and evaluate those first. Process means any activity involving a highly hazardous chemical, including using, storing, manufacturing, handling or moving such chemicals at the site, or any combination of these activities. For purposes of this definition, any interconnected group of vessels, as well as separate vessels located in a way that could involve highly hazardous chemicals in a potential release, are considered a single process. Employers must compile written process safety information before conducting any hazard analysis. The safety information will help the employer and the employees involved in operations to identify and understand the hazards posed by the process. The hazards of the chemicals used or produced by the process, the technology of the process, and the equipment used should all be covered in the process safety information. The following data regarding the chemical hazards must be in the written process safety information. Toxicity, permissible exposure limits, physical data, reactivity data, corrosivity data, thermal and chemical stability data, and hazardous effects of inadvertent mixing of different materials. In many cases, an MSDS, or Material Safety Data Sheet, meets this requirement for each chemical. Information on the technology of the process must include at least the following. A block flow diagram or simplified process flow diagram. Process chemistry. Maximum intended inventory. Safe upper and lower limits for such items as temperatures, pressures, flows, or compositions, and an evaluation of the consequences of deviations, including those affecting the safety and health of employees. Written information on the equipment used in the process must include at least the following materials of construction, piping and instrumentation diagrams, or PNIDs, electrical classification, relief system design and design basis, ventilation system design design codes and standards employed, material and energy balances for processes built after May 26, 1992, and safety systems, for example interlocks and detection or suppression systems. The employer must document that equipment complies with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. If the equipment was designed and constructed in accordance with codes or standards no longer in general use, the employer must determine and document the equipment is designed, maintained, inspected, tested, and operated in a safe manner. Once the process safety information has been completed and reviewed, the process hazard analysis, or PHA, can begin. The analysis is a thorough, orderly, systematic approach for identifying, evaluating, controlling, and preventing accidental releases in processes involving highly hazardous chemicals. The methodology for the process hazard analysis must be selected according to the complexity of the process. We will discuss briefly the various methods for analysis in a few minutes. 
Employers must first determine and document the priority order for conducting the PHA, using such considerations as the extent of the hazards, the number of potentially affected employees, as well as the age and operating history of the process. All process hazard analyses must be updated and revalidated every five years from their latest completion date. Okay, let's take a look now at the various acceptable methods to determine and evaluate the hazards of a particular process. The methods include what if, checklist, a what if checklist combination, hazard and operability study or HAZOP, failure mode and effects analysis, FMEA, fault tree analysis, or an appropriate equivalent methodology. The team performing the process hazard analysis must understand fully the method to be used. The team leader should be fully knowledgeable in the proper implementation of the method and impartial in the evaluation. At least one team member should be familiar with the process being analyzed. Methods may differ for parts of a process. For example, a process involving a series of unit operations of varying complexities and ages may use different methods and team members for each operation. The conclusions are then integrated into one final study and evaluation. Regardless of the method employed, the process hazard analysis must address at least the following. The hazards of the process, identification of any previous incident that had a potential for catastrophic consequences, engineering and administrative controls applicable to the hazards and their interrelationships, consequences of failure of engineering and administrative controls, facility siting, human factors, and a qualitative evaluation of a range of the possible safety and health effects on employees present if there is a failure of controls. Employers must keep on file all process hazard analyses, as well as updates or revalidation for each process covered by the process safety management standard. In addition, a documented list of resolutions for all recommendations must be kept for the life of the process. Here's a quick summary of what we've covered so far. The process safety management of highly hazardous chemicals is a federally mandated standard for preventing and controlling the accidental release of hazardous chemicals. If your company handles one of the listed chemicals, the company must comply with the standard. The standard also includes flammable fluids in quantities of 10,000 pounds or greater. Process safety information, including hazards of the chemicals, the technology and equipment used in the process must be established in writing prior to conducting the process hazard analysis. A competent team should be assembled and conduct the PHA using one or more of the approved methods. Moving on now, we will spend the rest of the program covering various responsibilities for complying with the PSM standard. The employer must develop and implement written operating procedures consistent with the process safety information. The written procedures must provide clear instructions for safely conducting activities involved in each covered process. The procedures must address at least the following elements. First, the steps for each operating phase, including initial startup, normal operations, temporary operations, emergency shutdown, including conditions under which emergency shutdown is required, and the assignment of shutdown responsibility to qualified operators to ensure emergency shutdown is executed safely emergency operations, normal shutdown, and startup following a turnaround or after an emergency shutdown. Operating limits, consequences of deviation, steps required to correct or avoid deviation, safety and health considerations, properties and hazards of the chemicals used, precautions necessary to prevent exposure, including engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment, control measures if physical or airborne exposure occurs, quality control for raw materials and control of hazardous chemical inventory, any special or unique hazards, and safety systems, for example, interlocks, detection or suppression systems, and their functions. The written operating procedures must be readily accessible to employees working in or maintaining a process. The procedures must be reviewed as often as necessary to ensure the procedures reflect current operating practices and certified as current annually by the employer to guard against outdating or inaccuracy. The employer must also develop and implement safe work practices providing for the control of the hazards during work. Such practices include lockout tagout, proper procedures for confined space entry or opening process equipment or piping, 
as well as control over entrance into a facility by other than operating personnel. Employee Participation Employers must consult with employees and their representatives on the development of process hazard analyses, as well as other elements of process management. Access to process hazard analyses and other information relevant to the standard must be provided to employees and their representatives. Training. Every employee involved in operating a process or a newly assigned process must be trained in an overview and operating procedures of that process. The training must include emphasis on the specific safety and health hazards of the process, emergency operations, including shutdown, and any other safe work practices applicable. Employees already operating a process need not be given initial training. The employer may instead certify in writing the employees have the required knowledge and skills to run the process safely. Refresher training must be provided at least every three years, or more often if necessary, to each involved employee. The employer, in consultation with the employee, determines the appropriate frequency of refresher training. A record must be kept of the identity of the employee, the dates of training, and how the employer verified the employee's competency. Okay, next topic, contractors. Many categories of contract labor may be present at a job site. Such workers may operate the facility or perform a particular aspect of a job because of their skill set. Others may work only for short periods when there is a need for increased labor quickly, such as in turnaround operations. PSM includes provisions for contractors and their employees, emphasizing the importance of everyone observing safe work practices, in particular not endangering those working nearby who may be employed by someone else. Process safety management, therefore, applies to contractors doing maintenance or repair, turnaround work, major renovation or specialty tasks on or adjacent to a process. But PSM does not include contractors providing incidental services not influencing process safety, such as janitorial, food and drink, laundry, delivery, or other supply services. Any employer retaining a contract employer must do the following. Obtain and evaluate information regarding the contractor's safety performance and programs when selecting a contractor. Inform contract employers of the known potential fire, explosion, or toxic release hazards related to the contractor's work and the process. Explain to contract employers the emergency action plan. Implement safe work practices to control the access of contract employees to covered process areas. Evaluate periodically contract employers' performance in fulfilling their obligations. Maintain a contract employee injury and illness log related to the process. Now let's review contract employer responsibilities. The contract employer must do the following. Ensure contract employees are competent in the work practices necessary to perform their job safely. Assure that contract employees are instructed in the known potential fire, explosion, or toxic release hazards related to their job and the process, as well as the emergency action plan. Document that each employee has received and understood the required PSM training including a record identifying the individual, date of training, and how competency was assessed. Ensure that each contract employee follows the safety rules of the facility, including safe work practices required in the operating procedures, and advise the employer of any unique hazards presented by the contract employer's work. A safety review should take place before any highly hazardous chemical is introduced into a process. So PSM requires the employer to perform a pre-startup safety review for new facilities and for modified facilities when the modification is significant enough to require a change in the process safety information. The pre-startup safety review must confirm the following. Construction and equipment are in accordance with design specifications. Safety, operating, maintenance, and emergency procedures are adequate and in place. A PHA has been performed for new facilities and recommendations have been resolved or implemented before startup, and modified facilities meet management of change requirements, and training has been completed for each employee involved in operating the process. Mechanical Integrity The employer must establish and implement written procedures to maintain the ongoing integrity of process equipment. PSM mechanical integrity requirements apply to the following equipment. Pressure vessels and storage tanks. 
piping systems, including piping components such as valves, relief and vent systems and devices, emergency shutdown systems, controls including monitoring devices and sensors, alarms and interlocks, and pumps. Employees involved in maintaining the ongoing integrity of process equipment must be trained in an overview of that process and its hazards and trained in the procedures applicable to the employee's job tasks. Inspection and testing must be performed on process equipment using procedures following recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. The frequency of such inspections and tests must conform with manufacturer's recommendations and good engineering practices or even more frequently if determined to be necessary from prior operating experience. Each inspection and test must be documented, identifying the date, name of the person conducting the test or inspection, serial number of the equipment, a description of the inspection or test, and the results. Equipment deficiencies outside the acceptable limits defined by the process safety information should be corrected before further use, with a few exceptions. In some cases, deficiencies may be corrected later, in a safe and timely manner, as long as other necessary steps are taken to ensure safe operation. The employer must ensure equipment being fabricated for new plants or processes is suitable for the application. Appropriate checks and inspections must be performed to ensure equipment is installed properly and is consistent with the design specifications and manufacturer's instructions. The employer must also ensure maintenance materials, spare parts and equipment are suitable for the process application. A permit must be used for hot work operations conducted on or near a covered process. The permit must document that fire prevention and protection requirements meeting OSHA regulations have been implemented prior to beginning the hot work. The permit must indicate the date authorized for hot work and identify the object on which hot work is to be performed. The permit must be kept on file until completion of the hot work. On the starter. Written procedures must be established and implemented to manage changes to process chemicals, technology, equipment and procedures, as well as any change to facilities affecting a covered process. Replacements in kind do not fall under this requirement. Management of change written procedures must address the following considerations. The technical basis for the proposed change. Impact of the change on employee safety and health. Modifications to operating procedures necessary time period for the change, and authorization requirements for the proposed change. All those whose job tasks will be affected by a change in the process must be informed and trained regarding the change prior to startup. Process safety information and written operating procedures must also be updated accordingly for the change. A crucial part of PSM calls for thorough investigation of incidents to identify events and root causes so corrective measures can be developed and implemented. Process safety management therefore requires an investigation of each incident that either caused or could have caused a catastrophic release of a highly hazardous chemical. The incident investigation must be initiated promptly and not later than 48 hours following the incident. The investigation team should consist of at least one person knowledgeable in the process involved, including a contract employee if the incident involved the work of a contractor. An investigation report must be prepared and include, at a minimum, the following. Date of the incident. Date the investigation began. Description of the incident. Factors contributing to the incident. And recommendations resulting from the incident. A system must be established to promptly address and resolve the incident report findings and recommendations. All resolutions and corrective actions must be documented and the report reviewed by all affected personnel whose job tasks are relevant to the incident findings, including contract employees. The reports must be kept by the employer for five years. Emergency planning and training employees in what to do in the event of an incident are required. An emergency action plan for the entire plant must be developed and implemented in accordance with OSHA Rules 29 CFR 1910.38 Section A. The emergency action plan must also include procedures for handling small releases of hazardous chemicals. Employers covered under PSM may also be subject to the OSHA Hazardous Waste and Response Regulation 29 CFR 1910.120 A, P, e, and Q.
Employers must certify they have evaluated compliance with PSM at least every three years in order to verify procedures and practices developed under the standard are adequate and being followed. The audit must be conducted by at least one person knowledgeable in the process, and a report of the audit findings must be developed and documented. The audit documentation should note deficiencies and corrections. The two most recent compliance audits must be kept on file. And that concludes our look at the components of the Process Safety Management Standard. More detail about the standard can be found on the OSHA website. Complying with the PSM standard is everyone's responsibility and helps ensure a safe workplace for all.